I stared at the text message on my phone, my vision blurring as tears welled up in my eyes. The bustling office around me faded into a dull hum. How could this be happening? Abby, are you okay? My assistant, Sarah, touched my arm gently. You look like you've seen a ghost. I blinked, forcing myself back to reality. I'm fine. I lied, my voice barely above a whisper. Just give me a moment, please. As Sarah retreated, I read the message again, hoping I'd somehow misunderstood. But there it was, plain as day. I saw Mark with another woman at Café Noir. They were definitely more than friends. I'm so sorry, Abby. My best friend Jen had always been brutally honest. But this? This couldn't be true. Mark and I had been married for ten years. We had our ups and downs, sure. But an affair? It seemed impossible. I grabbed my purse and rushed out of the office, ignoring the concerned looks from my colleagues. T. The crisp autumn air hit my face as I burst onto the sidewalk, my heels clicking furiously against the pavement. Café Noir was only a few blocks away. I had to see for myself. As I rounded the corner, my heart nearly stopped. There they were, sitting at an outdoor table, heads close together. Mark's hand rested on hers, his thumb tracing circles on her skin. I recognized her immediately. Lydia, the new marketing assistant at his firm. Young, beautiful, and apparently the object of my husband's affection. Before I could stop myself, I marched up to their table. Well, isn't this cozy? Mark's head snapped up, his face draining of color. Abby, what are you? Save it, I spat, my voice trembling with rage. I can't believe you, Mark. Ten years of marriage, and this is how you repay me? Lydia had the decency to look ashamed, quickly pulling her hand away from Mark's. I'm so sorry I didn't. I held up a hand, silencing her. Don't. Just don't. Mark stood up, reaching for me. Abby, please, let me explain. I stepped back my eyes burning with unshed tears. Explain what, Mark? How you've been lying to me? How you've been sneaking around behind my back? People at nearby tables were staring now, but I couldn't bring myself to care. My entire world was crumbling around me, and all I could feel was a searing, white-hot anger. I trusted you, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. I gave you everything. Mark's face crumpled. X. I know. I'm sorry. I never meant for this to happen. A bitter laugh escaped my lips. Of course not. It never does, does it? I turned to leave, but Mark grabbed my arm. Abby, wait. Please, can we talk about this? I yanked my arm free, fixing him with a glare that could have melted steel. There's nothing to talk about. You've made your choice. As I walked away, I could hear Mark calling after me, but I didn't look back. My phone buzzed in my purse. Probably my mother, Myra, wondering why I'd left work so abruptly. I ignored it. I wandered aimlessly through the city streets, my mind reeling. How had I not seen this coming? Were there signs I'd missed? And what was I supposed to do now? As the sun began to set, I found myself in front of our apartment building. My hand shook as I inserted the key into the lock. I stepped inside, the familiar scent of home hitting me like a punch to the gut. Our wedding photo hung on the wall, mocking me with its frozen smiles and promises of forever. In a fit of rage, I grabbed it and hurled it across the room. The sound of shattering glass was oddly satisfying. I sank to the floor, finally allowing the tears to fall. My phone buzzed again, and this time I answered. Abby? My mother's concerned voice filled my ear. What's going on? Are you all right? I took a shaky breath. No, Mom. I'm not all right, Mark. He's been cheating on me. The silence on the other end was deafening. Then, oh, sweetheart... I'm so sorry. What can I do? I closed my eyes, suddenly feeling every bit of my 35 years. I don't know, Mom. I just, I don't know what to do. I sat across from Mark at our kitchen table, my hands wrapped tightly around a mug of coffee. Two weeks had passed since I'd caught him with Lydia, and the pain still felt as fresh as ever. I want to make this work, Abby, Mark said, his voice low and pleading. Tell me what I can do to fix this. I sighed, feeling the weight of exhaustion settling over me. I don't know if you can fix this, Mark. You broke my trust. How am I supposed to move past that? Before he could respond, my phone buzzed. It was my mother, Myra, I answered, putting it on speaker. Abby, dear, Myra's voice filled the room. Have you two made any progress? I rolled my eyes. Mom, it's not that simple. Actually, Mark interrupted, I have an idea. What if we moved in with my family for a while? A change of scenery might do us good. I stared at him, incredulous. You can't be serious. It's not a bad idea, Myra chimed in. 
Sometimes being around family can help heal wounds. I felt cornered. Mom, you can't possibly think. Abby, Myra's tone turned stern. You've worked too hard on this marriage to throw it away. Give it a chance. I looked at Mark, who was watching me with hopeful eyes. Part of me wanted to scream, to tell them both they were crazy. But another part, a smaller, more desperate part, wondered if this might be our last chance. Fine, I said finally, my voice barely above a whisper. We'll try it, but I'm not making any promises. The relief on Mark's face was palpable. Thank you, Abby. You won't regret this. But as I hung up the phone and met Mark's gaze, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was making a terrible mistake. Two days later, we were pulling up to Mark's family home, a sprawling Victorian house that always felt more like a museum than a home. Mark's sister Julia was waiting on the porch, her arms crossed tightly over her chest. Well, well, she said as we got out of the car. Look who finally decided to grace us with their presence. I forced a smile. Hello, Julia. Thanks for having us. She sniffed, turning on her heel. Come on, then. Mother's waiting inside. As we followed Julia into the house, I felt Mark's hand on the small of my back. It was meant to be comforting, I'm sure, but it only served to remind me of how he'd touched Lydia that day at the cafe. Mark's mother, Eleanor, greeted us in the foyer. Her smile was warm, but her eyes were calculating. Abby, dear, we're so glad you've decided to give Mark another chance. I bristled at her words. I haven't decided anything yet, Eleanor. We're just trying. Julia snorted. Trying? Is that what we're calling it now? Julia, Mark warned, but she just rolled her eyes. I'm just saying what we're all thinking, she said, her voice dripping with disdain. If Abby were really committed to this marriage, she wouldn't need to try. She'd just forgive and forget. I felt my temper flare. Excuse me. Your brother cheated on me. I think I'm entitled to some time to process that. The room fell silent. Eleanor cleared her throat. Perhaps we should all get settled in. Julia, why don't you show Abby to her room? Julia's eyes narrowed. Her room? I thought they'd be sharing. Mark stepped in. We thought it best to have separate rooms for now. Give each other some space. I could see the wheels turning in Julia's head, no doubt concocting some new new way to make my life miserable. But she plastered on a fake smile and gestured for me to follow her. As we climbed the stairs, Julia's voice drifted back to me. You know, Abby, not everyone gets a second chance. You should be grateful Mark's willing to overlook your shortcomings. I stopped short. My shortcomings? What's that supposed to mean? She turned, her smile sharp as a knife. Oh, nothing. I just think it's admirable that Mark's willing to work things out, considering... Considering what? I demanded. Julia shrugged. Well, you're not exactly getting any younger, are you? And let's face it, your career has always come first. It's no wonder Mark felt neglected. I felt like I'd been slapped. Before I could respond, Julia continued up the stairs, leaving me standing there, my fists clenched at my sides. In that moment, I realized this wasn't just about saving my marriage. This was war, and Julia had just fired the first shot. I woke up to the sound of hushed voices outside my door. Glancing at the clock, I saw it was barely 6 a.m. I crept closer, straining to hear. She doesn't belong here, Mark, Julia's voice hissed. Can't you see what she's doing to this family? Keep your voice down, Mark replied. Abby's trying, Julia. We all are. I heard Julia scoff. Trying? Please. She's just biding her time, waiting to take you for everything you've got. My blood boiled. How dare she? I flung open the door, startling them both. If anyone's trying to take something, it's you, Julia, I snapped. What's your problem with me? Julia's eyes narrowed. My problem? You're the one who can't let go of one little mistake. Little mistake? I laughed bitterly. Your brother cheated on me. Mark stepped between us. Please, both of you, calm down. I turned on him. And you? Are you going to let her talk to me like this? Before Mark could respond, Eleanor appeared at the end of the hallway. What's all this commotion? Julia immediately switched to a saccharine tone. Nothing, mother. We were just discussing breakfast plans. I opened my mouth to protest, but Mark shot me a pleading look. I bit my tongue, seething. Eleanor smiled, oblivious to the tension. Wonderful. Abby, dear, why don't you help me in the kitchen? As I followed Eleanor downstairs, I could feel Julia's smug gaze burning into my back. In the kitchen, Eleanor handed me an apron. Now, Abby, I know you're not much of a cook, but I'm sure you can manage to set the table. 
I bristled at her condescending tone but forced a smile. Of course, Eleanor. As I laid out plates and cutlery, Eleanor prattled on about family traditions and the importance of a woman's touch in the home. I tuned her out, focusing on not breaking the expensive china in my grip. Breakfast was a tense affair. Julia dominated the conversation, regaling everyone with stories of her successful career and social life. I pushed my food around my plate, feeling increasingly out of place. So, Abby, Julia said suddenly, her tone sickly sweet. How's work? Oh, wait, I forgot, you're on a sabbatical, right? I gritted my teeth. It's called compassionate leave, Julia. Some companies actually care about their employees' well-being. Julia's smile didn't falter. Of course, it must be nice to have so much free time. Maybe you could use it to brush up on your domestic skills. Before I could retort, Mark's phone buzzed. He glanced at it, his face paling slightly. Everything all right, dear? Eleanor asked. Mark nodded, a bit too quickly. Just work, if you'll excuse me. As he left the room, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I excused myself and followed him, finding him in the study, speaking in hushed tones. Lydia, you can't keep calling me, I heard him say. I told you, it's over. My heart stopped. Lydia? He was still in contact with her? Mark's voice dropped even lower. No, I haven't told her. Look, I need time, okay? Just give me some time. I stumbled back, my mind reeling. What hadn't he told me? What was he hiding? As I turned to leave, I bumped into a side table, knocking over a vase. The crash echoed through the house. Mark burst out of the study, his face a mix of guilt and surprise. Abby, I, I can explain. I held up a hand, fighting back tears. Save it, Mark. I've heard enough. Julia appeared in the doorway, her eyes gleaming with malicious curiosity. Oh my, what's happened now? I pushed past her, heading for the stairs. Ask your brother. I spat. As I reached my room, I heard Eleanor's voice floating up from below. Mark, darling, is everything all right? I slammed the door, muffling Mark's response. Leaning against it, I slid to the floor, my head in my hands. What was I doing here? This wasn't saving my marriage. This was slowly destroying what little self-respect I had left. A soft knock on the door startled me. Abby? It was Mark. Can we talk? I took a deep breath, stealing myself. It was time for some answers and I was going to get them, no matter the cost. I opened the door, my jaw set and eyes blazing. Mark stood there, looking like a deer caught in headlights. Abby, I... Save it, I cut him off. I want the truth, Mark. All of it. Now, he sighed, shoulders slumping, can we talk somewhere private? I nodded curtly and followed him to the study. As soon as the door closed, I rounded on him. You're still talking to Lydia? After everything? Mark ran a hand through his hair. It's not what you think. She's... she's pregnant, Abby. The world seemed to tilt on its axis. I gripped the edge of the desk to steady myself. What? I just found out, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I don't know what to do. I laughed bitterly. Oh, that's rich. You don't know what to do. How about not cheating on your wife in the first place? Before Mark could respond, the door burst open. Julia stood there, a look of mock concern on her face. Is everything okay? I heard raised voices. I glared at her. This is none of your business, Julia. She ignored me, turning to Mark. Brother dear, what's wrong? You look awful. Mark hesitated, glancing between us. I could see the moment he caved. Lydia's pregnant. He blurted out. Julia's eyes widened, then a slow smile spread across her face. Oh, Mark, what a predicament you found yourself in. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you actually enjoying this? I asked, incredulous. Julia shrugged. I'm just concerned for my brother's well-being, unlike some people who only seem to care about themselves. That was the last straw. Get out, I snarled. Both of you. Now. They left, Julia practically dragging Mark out. Then as soon as the door closed, I collapsed into a chair, my mind reeling. Hours later, I emerged from the study, emotionally drained but determined. I found Eleanor in the living room, arranging flowers. Ah, Abby, she said, not looking up. Be a dear and fetch the good china. We're having guests for dinner. I took a deep breath. Actually, Eleanor, I need to talk to you about something. She finally looked at me, her expression guarded. Oh, what about? I overheard Mark on the phone earlier, I began. His, his mistress is pregnant. Eleanor's face remained impassive. I see, and what do you plan to do about it? I blinked, taken aback by her lack of reaction. You, you knew? She sighed, setting down her flowers. Abby, dear, these things happen in marriages. The important thing is how we handle them. 
handle them. I repeated, my voice rising. He cheated on me, Eleanor, and now there's a baby involved. Eleanor's eyes hardened. Lower your voice. We don't air our dirty laundry in public. Public? This is your home. Exactly, she snapped, and in this home we stand by family, no matter what. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So what? I'm just supposed to accept this? Pretend everything's fine? Eleanor stood, smoothing her skirt. You're supposed to be a supportive wife. Now about that china. No, I said firmly. I won't be fetching anything. I'm not your maid, Eleanor. Her eyes narrowed. Now listen here, young lady. While you're under my roof. While I'm under your roof, what? I challenged. You'll treat me like a servant? Expect me to turn a blind eye to your son's infidelity? Eleanor's face flushed with anger. If you can't behave like a proper wife and daughter-in-law, perhaps it's best you leave. Maybe I will, I shot back. Just then, Julia appeared in the doorway. Is everything all right? I heard shouting. Eleanor composed herself quickly. Everything's fine, dear. Abby was just offering to help with dinner preparations, weren't you, Abby? I opened my mouth to protest, but the look in Eleanor's eyes stopped me cold. It was a challenge, daring me to make a scene. In that moment, I realized I had a choice to make. I could walk away, admit defeat, and let them win. Or I could stay and fight, on their turf, and by their rules. I forced a smile. Of course, Eleanor. I'd be happy to help. As I followed her to the kitchen, I caught Julia's smug grin. Little did they know, this was far from over. If they wanted to play games, I'd show them just how good I could be at playing dirty. I was elbow-deep in soapy water, scrubbing dishes from yet another elaborate family dinner, when my phone buzzed. It was a notification from my banking app. Curious, I dried my hands and checked it. My heart nearly stopped. There was a transfer of $5,000 to an account I didn't recognize. I quickly scrolled through my recent transactions, my blood running cold as I spotted several similar transfers over the past few weeks. What the hell? I muttered, my mind racing. I hadn't made these transfers. Which meant... The sound of laughter drifted in from the living room. I peered around the corner to see Julia, sprawled on the couch, showing off a pair of designer shoes to Eleanor. Aren't they divine, mother? Julia cooed. I simply had to have them. Eleanor beamed. They're lovely, dear. You deserve to treat yourself. My eyes narrowed. The price tag on those shoes looked awfully familiar. I stormed into the living room, my phone clutched tightly in my hand. Julia, we need to talk. Now. She looked up, annoyed. Can't you see I'm busy? Oh, I can see exactly what you've been busy with, I snapped, thrusting my phone in her face. Care to explain these transfers? Julia's face paled for a moment before she regained her composure. I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't play dumb, I hissed. You've been stealing from me. Eleanor stood up, her face a mask of concern. Abby, dear, surely there's been some mistake. Julia would never. Save it, Eleanor, I cut her off. I want answers, and I want them now. Just then, Mark walked in. What's going on? I turned to him, my voice shaking with rage. Your sister has been helping herself to my money. Thousands of dollars, Mark. Mark looked bewildered. Julia, is this true? Julia's eyes filled with tears. Of course not. How could you even think that, Mark? After everything I've done for this family. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Everything you've done? You mean like making my life a living hell since I got here? That's enough. Eleanor's voice cut through the tension. Abby, I won't have you making such wild accusations in my home. I gaped at her. Wild accusations? I have proof. Eleanor waved her hand dismissively. I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. Perhaps you've forgotten about these transfers. You have been under a lot of stress lately. I turned to Mark, desperate for support. But he just stood there, looking uncomfortable. Mark, I pleaded. You can't seriously believe this. He ran a hand through his hair. Abby, maybe we should discuss this privately. I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. I felt like I was losing my mind. A misunderstanding? Your sister is a thief, and you're all just going to pretend it didn't happen. Julia stood up, her face a picture of injured innocence. I can't believe you'd stoop so low, Abby, making up lies just because you're jealous of my success. Jealous? I sputtered. Of what? Your ability to mooch off others? That's it, Eleanor snapped. Abby, I think you need to go to your room and calm down. We'll discuss this when you're in a more reasonable state of mind. I looked around the room, at the faces of my so-called family. 
Julia, smug and unrepentant, Eleanor, cold and dismissive, and Mark, weak and indecisive. In that moment, something inside me snapped. No, I said, my voice low and dangerous. I'm done being reasonable. I'm done playing by your rules. I turned to Julia, a slow smile spreading across my face. You want to play dirty? Fine. But remember, you started this war, and I intend to finish it. With that, I stormed out of the room, leaving a stunned silence in my wake. As I climbed the stairs to my room, my mind was already racing with plans. They thought they could walk all over me? They had no idea what I was capable of. It was time to show this family exactly who they were dealing with, and God help them when I did. I was in the middle of plotting my next move when I overheard Julia on the phone in the hallway. Her excited whispers piqued my curiosity. Yes, Jacob, I can't wait to tell everyone, she gushed. The ring is absolutely stunning. You shouldn't have spent so much. My ears perked up. Jacob? Ring? Was Julia getting engaged? I crept closer to the door, straining to hear more. Of course, darling. We'll announce it at the family dinner next week. It'll be perfect. As Julia's footsteps faded away, a plan began to form in my mind. This engagement could be the key to exposing Julia for who she really was. Over the next few days, I played the part of the dutiful sister-in-law, helping with dinner preparations and feigning excitement about Julia's surprise announcement. All the while, I was gathering evidence of her deceit. The night of the dinner arrived, and the house was buzzing with anticipation. I watched as Julia preened in front of the mirror, adjusting her designer dress, no doubt bought with my money. You look lovely, dear, Eleanor cooed. Jacob is a lucky man. I bit back a retort and plastered on a smile. Yes, he certainly is. As guests began to arrive, I slipped away to the study. I needed to make a crucial phone call. Myra, it's Abby. I need your help. My mother's concerned voice came through the line. Abby, what's wrong? I took a deep breath. I'm about to do something drastic, Mom. I need you to trust me. There was a pause. Abby, what are you planning? Justice, I said firmly. Can you be here in an hour? After getting Myra's assurance, I rejoined the party. Julia was in her element, flitting from guest to guest, her left hand conspicuously bare. I caught Mark's eye across the room, and he gave me a weak smile. My heart clenched. Despite everything, a part of me still loved him. Finally, Jacob arrived. He was tall, handsome, and clearly wealthy, exactly Julia's type. I watched as she fawned over him, playing the part of the perfect girlfriend. As dinner was served, Julia clinked her glass. Everyone, Jacob and I, have an announcement to make. The room fell silent as Julia held up her left hand, now adorned with a massive diamond ring. We're engaged. The room erupted in cheers and congratulations. I stood up, my heart pounding. It was now or never. I'd like to make a toast, I said, my voice cutting through the chatter. Julia's eyes narrowed, but she nodded graciously. I raised my glass. To Julia and Jacob, may your life together be as honest and transparent as Julia has always been. A ripple of confusion went through the room. Julia's smile faltered. In fact, I continued, I think it's only fair that Jacob knows exactly what kind of woman he's marrying. Abby? Mark warned, but I ignored him. I turned to Jacob. Did you know that your fiancé has been stealing money from me? Thousands of dollars used to fund her lavish lifestyle? The room fell deathly silent. Julia's face drained of color. That's ridiculous, she sputtered. You have no proof. Oh, but I do, I said, pulling out a stack of bank statements. And that's not all. Julia, why don't you tell everyone about the affair you've been having with Jacob's business partner? Jacob's head snapped towards Julia. What? Just then, the doorbell rang. Eleanor moved to answer it, but I beat her to it. I opened the door to reveal my mother, Myra, and a man I didn't recognize. Perfect timing, I said. Everyone, I'd like you to meet Detective Johnson. He's here to discuss the fraudulent activities happening in this house. Chaos erupted. Julia lunged at me, her face contorted with rage. You bitch. You've ruined everything. As Mark and Jacob pulled Julia away, I locked eyes with my mother. Her expression was a mix of shock and pride. In that moment, standing in the midst of the pandemonium I'd created, I felt a surge of triumph. The truth was finally out, and there was no going back. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of the storm. The room erupted into chaos. Julia's face contorted with rage as she lunged at me, her perfectly manicured nails barely missing my face. You vindictive bitch, she screamed. Mark and Jacob wrestled her away, 
but the damage was done. The facade of the perfect family had shattered. Detective Johnson stepped forward, his voice cutting through the pandemonium. Miss Julia, I'm going to need you to come with me for questioning. Eleanor's shrill voice pierced the air. This is preposterous. I won't allow it. I turned to her, my voice steady despite my racing heart. You don't have a choice, Eleanor. The evidence is irrefutable. As the detective led Julia away, I caught sight of Jacob's devastated face. For a moment, I felt a twinge of guilt. But then I remembered all the pain and humiliation I'd endured, and my resolve hardened. Mark approached me, his face a mask of confusion and anger. Abby, how could you do this? She's my sister. I met his gaze unflinchingly. And I'm your wife, Mark. Or have you forgotten that in between your affair with Lydia and defending your thieving sister? His face paled. You know about Lydia? Oh, I know everything, I spat, including the fact that she's pregnant. A collective gasp went through the room. Eleanor swayed on her feet, looking as if she might faint. Myra stepped forward, placing a steadying hand on my shoulder. Abby, perhaps we should continue this discussion in private. But I was beyond caring about propriety or privacy. The dam had broken, and years of pent-up frustration and anger came pouring out. No, Mom, I'm done hiding the truth. This family has been living a lie, and it's time everyone knew it. I turned to address the stunned guests. Mark has been cheating on me with his colleague. Julia has been stealing from me to fund her lavish lifestyle, and Eleanor and Myra have been turning a blind eye to all of it. The silence that followed was deafening. Then, unexpectedly, a slow clap started from the back of the room. I turned to see Lydia, her pregnant belly visible beneath her fitted dress. Bravo, Abby, she said, her voice dripping with sarcasm. You've certainly put on quite a show. Mark's face drained of color. Lydia, what are you doing here? She sauntered forward, a wicked gleam in her eye. I came to congratulate the happy couple, but it seems I've walked into something far more entertaining. I felt my control slipping. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. You have no right to be here, I hissed. Lydia laughed. Oh, but I think I do. After all, I'm carrying the next generation of this dysfunctional family. The room exploded into chaos once again. Accusations flew, tears were shed, and years of secrets came tumbling out. Through it all, I stood rooted to the spot, watching as the life I'd known crumbled around me. I'd wanted justice, revenge even, but this, this was destruction on a scale I hadn't anticipated. As the police arrived to sort out the mess, I felt a hand on my arm. It was Myra, her eyes filled with a mixture of pride and concern. Abby, she said softly, what happens now? I looked around the room, at Mark's defeated slump, Eleanor's shocked tears, the gossiping guests. Then I met my mother's gaze. Now, I said, my voice barely above a whisper, now we rebuild. But as the words left my mouth, I wondered if there was anything left to salvage from the wreckage of this night. I'd won the battle, but at what cost? As Detective Johnson approached me for a statement, I steeled myself. The war wasn't over yet, and I had a feeling the worst was yet to come. The days following Julia's disastrous engagement party were a blur of police statements, legal consultations, and tearful confrontations. I moved out of Mark's family home and into a small apartment, my mother insisting on staying with me. You don't have to do this alone, Abby, Myra said, unpacking a box of kitchenware. I sighed, collapsing onto the couch. I know, Mom. But I feel like I've torn this family apart. She sat beside me, taking my hand. No, sweetheart, they did that themselves. You just exposed the truth. A week later, I found myself face to face with Mark in our lawyer's office. He looked haggard, the weight of his actions evident in the dark circles under his eyes. Abby, he began, his voice hoarse. I know I've hurt you beyond measure, but is there any chance we could... I held up a hand, silencing him. No, Mark, there's no going back, not after everything that's happened. He nodded, defeated. As we signed the divorce papers, I felt a mix of sadness and relief wash over me. It was really over. Outside the office, I bumped into Jacob. His once confident demeanor was gone, replaced by a haunted look. I'm sorry, I said softly. I never meant to hurt you. He shook his head. Don't apologize, you saved me from a lifetime of deceit. Thank you. As he walked away, I realized that my actions, while painful, had freed more than just myself from Julia's web of lies. The final showdown came a month later, at Julia's trial. I sat in the courtroom, my heart pounding as she was let in, looking nothing like the polished socialite I'd known. 
Her eyes met mine, filled with a mixture of hatred and desperation. For a moment, I almost pitied her. Almost. As the judge read out the charges, fraud, embezzlement, theft, I felt a weight lifting from my shoulders. Justice was finally being served. When it was my turn to testify, I stood tall, my voice steady as I recounted Julia's manipulations and thefts. I could feel Eleanor's glare burning into my back, but I didn't falter. Miss Thompson, the prosecutor asked, why did you wait so long to come forward? I took a deep breath. I wanted to believe in family, in loyalty. But I realized that true loyalty means standing up for what's right, even when it's difficult. As I stepped down, I caught sight of Lydia in the back of the courtroom, her hand resting on her swollen belly. Our eyes met, and I saw a flicker of respect in hers. We'd never be friends, but in that moment I felt we understood each other. The verdict came swiftly, guilty on all counts. As Julia was led away, I felt no joy, only a profound sense of closure. Outside the courthouse, surrounded by a swarm of reporters, I felt my mother's arm around my shoulders. You did it, Abby, she whispered. You stood up for yourself. I turned to her, tears in my eyes. We did it, Mom. I couldn't have done this without you. As we pushed through the crowd, I caught sight of Mark standing alone, watching us. For a moment, our eyes met, and I saw regret, sorrow, and perhaps a glimmer of pride. I nodded to him once, then turned away. That chapter of my life was closed. Later that evening, I stood on the balcony of my new apartment, watching the sun set over the city. My phone buzzed with a message from my old boss, offering me my job back. I smiled, feeling a surge of excitement for the first time in months. Tomorrow, I'd return to work. I'd rebuild my career, my life, my sense of self. As the last rays of sunlight faded, I raised a glass to the sky. Here's to new beginnings, I whispered. I'd been through hell, but I'd emerged stronger, wiser, and finally, truly free. The future was uncertain, but for the first time in years, I was ready to face it head on. After all, I was Abby Thompson, and I was nobody's victim anymore. I never thought I'd be standing at my father's funeral, alone, while my husband was off gallivanting with his mistress. Just a few short years ago, life seemed perfect. Liam and I met through my father, who was his mentor at work. Dad always spoke highly of Liam, praising his intelligence and work ethic. When Liam asked me out, I was thrilled. Our courtship was a whirlwind of romantic dinners, long walks in the park, and endless conversations about our hopes and dreams. We married within a year, and my father couldn't have been happier. He loved Liam like a son and was overjoyed to see us build a life together. But then, everything changed. Dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and given just three months to live. I was devastated, but I expected Liam to be my rock, to support me through this difficult time. Instead, he grew distant and cold. He started staying late at work, claiming he had important projects to finish. When I begged him to visit Dad with me, he always had an excuse. I'm too busy, he'd say, his eyes glued to his phone as he typed out another text. I confided in my best friend Olivia about my marital problems. She listened patiently as I poured out my heart, tears streaming down my face. I don't know what to do, I sobbed. Liam is like a different person. He's so selfish and uncaring. It's like he doesn't even love me anymore. Olivia hugged me tightly. I'm so sorry, Evelyn. You don't deserve this. Have you tried talking to him about how you feel? I nodded miserably. Every time I bring it up, he just shuts me down. He says I'm being too emotional, that I need to focus on my job and stop relying on him so much. He even had the nerve to complain about my salary as a teacher, saying I don't contribute enough to our household finances. Olivia's eyes flashed with anger. That's awful, Evelyn. He has no right to treat you that way especially not now. Despite my best efforts, Liam remained unmoved. When Dad started an experimental treatment, I hoped it might buy us more time together. I visited him alone, praying that Liam would have a change of heart, and for a brief moment, it seemed like he did. He agreed to visit Dad with me just once. But the entire time, he was glued to his phone, texting someone with a smirk on his face. He barely said two words to Dad, who looked so frail and weak in his hospital bed. A few days later, I received the call I'd been dreading. Dad had taken a turn for the worse. I rushed to the hospital, my heart pounding in my chest, but it was too late. He was gone before I arrived, leaving me heartbroken and alone. When I called Liam to tell him the news, he barely reacted. I'm sorry for your loss, he said flatly, 
but I can't make it to the funeral. I have a business trip. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My father, the man who had been like a second dad to him, was dead, and all he could think about was work. But the final blow came when I was leaving for the funeral. Liam pressed a single dollar bill into my hand, a smirk on his face. For the funeral expenses, he said, before walking away. I stood there, stunned, the crumpled bill in my hand. In that moment, something inside me snapped. I knew I could never forgive him for this ultimate betrayal. And I knew that somehow, some way, I would make him pay. As I stood at my father's graveside, the weight of my grief was almost unbearable. The only thing that kept me standing was the burning anger I felt towards Liam. How could he abandon me like this, in my darkest hour? How could he be so callous, so unfeeling? I barely registered the condolences of the other mourners, their words washing over me like a distant tide. All I could think about was the way Liam had treated me, the way he had betrayed my father's memory. I clutched the single dollar bill he had given me, my fingers trembling with rage. After the funeral, I returned home to an empty house. Liam was still away on his business trip, and I couldn't bear the thought of being alone with my thoughts. I called Olivia, my voice shaking as I asked her to come over. When she arrived, I collapsed into her arms, sobbing uncontrollably. I can't do this anymore, I choked out. I can't be married to a man who treats me like this. Olivia rubbed my back soothingly. I know, honey. I'm so sorry you're going through this, but you're not alone. I'm here for you, no matter what. We sat together on the couch, sipping tea and talking for hours. Olivia listened patiently as I poured out my heart, my anger and grief spilling out in equal measure. I just don't understand how he could be so cruel, I said. My father loved him like a son, and this is how he repays him? Olivia's eyes narrowed. You know, Evelyn, I've been thinking. What if there's more to this than meets the eye? What if Liam is hiding something from you? I frowned. Like what? Like an affair, Olivia said bluntly. It would explain why he's been so distant, why he's always on his phone, and why he didn't want to visit your dad in the hospital. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. An affair? Could it be true? I thought back to all the late nights at work, the secretive texts the way Liam had pulled away from me. It all started to make a twisted kind of sense. But how can I know for sure, I asked, my voice trembling. Olivia leaned forward, her eyes glinting with determination. We hire a private investigator. We find out the truth once and for all, and then we make him pay for what he's done to you. I hesitated for a moment, my mind reeling. Did I really want to go down this path? Did I want to stoop to Liam's level to seek revenge? But then I thought of my father, of the way Liam had betrayed him. And I knew that I had no choice. Okay, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Let's do it. The next few weeks passed in a blur. Olivia and I met with the private investigator, a grizzled ex-cop named Jack. He listened to my story with a sympathetic ear, his eyes hardening as I described Liam's behavior. Don't worry, Mrs. Thompson, he said. We'll get to the bottom of this, and if your husband is cheating on you— We'll catch him red-handed. I tried to go about my life as normally as possible, but it was hard. Every time Liam walked through the door, I felt a surge of anger and betrayal. I couldn't look him in the eye, couldn't bear to be in the same room as him. And still, he seemed oblivious to my pain, lost in his own selfish world. Two months after my father's funeral, Jack called me with the news I had been dreading. Mrs. Thompson, he said, his voice grave. We have evidence that your husband is having an affair with a co-worker named Sophia. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but I thought you should know. I felt like the ground had dropped out from under me. So it was true. Liam had betrayed me in the worst possible way. And now I knew what I had to do. I had to make him pay for what he had done. I had to destroy him, just as he had destroyed me. The evidence of Liam's affair felt like a knife twisting in my gut. I couldn't eat couldn't sleep, couldn't focus on anything but the betrayal that had shattered my world. I went through the motions of my daily life, teaching my classes and grading papers, but inside I was a wreck. Liam, on the other hand, seemed completely unfazed. He continued to stay late at work, to spend hours on his phone texting God knows who. When he was home, he was distant and irritable, snapping at me over the smallest things. One evening, as we sat in stony silence at the dinner table— Liam finally spoke. 
You know, Evelyn, I've been thinking. Maybe it's time for you to quit your job and stay home full time. It's not like you're contributing much to our finances anyway. I stared at him in disbelief. Excuse me. I'm a teacher, Liam. I'm shaping young minds, making a difference in the world. And in case you've forgotten, my salary helps pay our bills. Liam snorted. Please, you're barely making a dent. I'm the one bringing home the big bucks here. And frankly, I'm tired of coming home to a messy house and a wife who's too exhausted to take care of my needs. I felt my blood boil. Your needs? What about my needs, Liam? What about the fact that I'm grieving the loss of my father and you can't even be bothered to support me? What about the fact that you're cheating on me with some bimbo from work? Liam's eyes narrowed. What are you talking about? I laughed bitterly. Don't play dumb with me, Liam. I know all about your little fling with Sophia. I have proof. For a moment, Liam looked stunned. Then his face hardened. You've been spying on me? How dare you? How dare I? I shouted, rising to my feet. How dare you betray me like this? How dare you disrespect my father's memory and our marriage vows? You're a selfish, lying bastard, and I'm done with you. Liam stood up too, his face twisted with rage. You're done with me? Fine, but don't expect a penny from me in the divorce. I'll make sure you end up with nothing. I laughed again, a harsh, ugly sound. You think I care about your money, Liam? You think that's what this is about? I, I loved you, you son of a bitch. I trusted you, and you threw it all away for some cheap thrill. Liam grabbed his coat and stormed out of the house, slamming the door behind him. I sank back into my chair, my body shaking with anger and grief. I knew then that there was no going back. My marriage was over, and the man I had once loved was dead to me. The next day, I called Olivia and told her everything. She listened in silence, her face growing darker with each revelation. When I finished, she took my hand and squeezed it tightly. Evelyn, I'm so sorry. I can't imagine how much pain you must be in right now. But you're not alone in this. I'm here for you, and I'll support you every step of the way. I nodded, blinking back tears. I know, Liv, and I'm grateful for that. But I need more than just support right now. I need revenge. Olivia's eyes widened. Revenge? What do you mean? I took a deep breath, stealing myself for what I was about to say. I want to destroy Liam. Liv, I want to ruin his life just like he ruined mine. I want to take everything from him and leave him with nothing. Olivia was silent for a long moment. Then she nodded slowly. Okay, if that's what you need to do, then I'm with you. But we have to be smart about this, Evelyn. We can't just go off half-cocked. I nodded, a, a grim smile spreading across my face. Oh, don't worry. I have a plan. And by the time I'm done, Liam will wish he had never met me. The next few weeks were a blur of hospital visits and hushed conversations with doctors. Dad's experimental treatment had started, but it was taking a toll on his already weakened body. He was in constant pain, and the medication made him groggy and disoriented. I spent every spare moment by his bedside, holding his hand and trying to keep his spirits up. Liam, on the other hand, was nowhere to be seen. He always had an excuse for why he couldn't come to the hospital. A big project at work, a client meeting, a networking event. It was like he couldn't be bothered to support me or my father in our time of need. One evening, as I sat by Dad's bedside, I finally broached the subject with Liam over the phone. Dad's not doing well, I said, my voice trembling. The doctors say the treatment is his last hope. I really need you here with me, Liam. I can't do this alone. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Then Liam sighed heavily. Evelyn, I'm sorry, but I can't just drop everything and come to the hospital every time you snap your fingers. I have responsibilities at work, and I can't afford to take time off right now. I felt like I had been slapped. Responsibilities? Liam, this is my father we're talking about, the man who mentored you, who treated you like a son, and you can't even be bothered to visit him on his deathbed. Liam's voice turned cold. Look, I'll try to stop by this weekend, okay? But I can't make any promises. And frankly, Evelyn, I think you're being a bit dramatic about all this. Your father's a fighter. He'll pull through. I hung up the phone my hands shaking with anger and disbelief. How could Liam be so callous, so unfeeling? Did he really care so little about me and my family? True to his word, Liam did stop by the hospital that weekend. But he might as well not have bothered. He spent the entire visit glued to his phone, texting and scrolling through emails. 
When I tried to engage him in conversation, he responded with monosyllabic grunts and shrugs. Dad, who was barely lucid, seemed to sense the tension between us. He reached out and grabbed Liam's hand, his grip surprisingly strong. Take care of my girl, Liam, he rasped, his eyes boring into my husband's. She's going to need you more than ever now. Liam nodded, a tight smile on his face. Of course, Jack. You can count on me. But as soon as we left the hospital room, Liam's demeanor changed. He pulled his hand away from mine and stalked off down the hallway, his eyes fixed on his phone screen. I had to jog to keep up with him. Liam, wait, I called out. Can we talk about this? About us? Liam spun around, his face twisted with annoyance. There's nothing to talk about, Evelyn. I came to the hospital, just like you asked. What more do you want from me? I stared at him, my heart breaking into a million pieces. I want you to be here for me, Liam. I want you to support me, to love me, to be the husband you promised to be when we got married. Liam rolled his eyes. God, Evelyn, you're so needy. I can't be your emotional crutch every time something bad happens. I have my own life, my own needs. And right now, those needs don't include sitting around a hospital room watching your father die. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving me standing alone in the hallway, tears streaming down my face. In that moment, I knew that my marriage was truly over. Liam had shown his true colors, and they were ugly and selfish and cruel. And I knew that I would never forgive him for abandoning me when I needed him most. The call came in the middle of the night, jolting me out of a restless sleep. It was the hospital, telling me that Dad had taken a turn for the worse, and that I needed to come right away. I stumbled out of bed, my heart pounding in my chest, and raced to the hospital as fast as I could but I was too late. By the time I arrived, Dad was gone, his body still and lifeless on the hospital bed. I collapsed into the chair beside him, sobbing uncontrollably, my entire world shattered into a million pieces. I don't know how long I sat there, holding Dad's hand and crying until I had no tears left. At some point, a nurse came in and gently told me that I needed to leave, that they had to prepare Dad's body for the funeral home. I nodded numbly and stumbled out of the room, my legs barely able to support my weight. I called Liam on the way home, my voice thick with tears. Dad's gone, I choked out. He passed away before I could get to the hospital. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Then Liam sighed heavily. I'm sorry for your loss, Evelyn. But I told you, I have a business trip this weekend. I can't just cancel it at the last minute. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. A business trip? Liam, my father just died. I need you here with me, not off schmoozing with clients. Liam's voice turned cold. Evelyn, I have responsibilities at work. I can't just drop everything because your father passed away. You're going to have to handle this on your own. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Handle it on my own? Liam, I'm your wife. We're supposed to support each other through things like this. How can you be so heartless? Liam sighed again, like I was being unreasonable. Look. I'll try to make it back for the funeral, okay? But I can't promise anything. And frankly, Evelyn, I think you're overreacting. People die all the time. It's a part of life. I hung up the phone, my hands shaking with anger and disbelief. How could Liam be so callous, so unfeeling? Did he really care so little about me and my family? The day of the funeral arrived, and I woke up to an empty bed. Liam had already left for his business trip, leaving me to face the day alone. I dressed mechanically, my mind numb with grief, and drove to the funeral home in a daze. The service was a blur of tearful eulogies and somber hymns. I sat in the front row, my eyes fixed on Dad's casket, barely registering the words being spoken. Olivia sat beside me, holding my hand tightly, her presence the only thing keeping me from falling apart completely. After the service I stood by the casket, accepting condolences from friends and family. Liam was nowhere to be seen and I felt a fresh wave of anger and betrayal wash over me. How could he abandon me like this, on the worst day of my life? As I was leaving the funeral home, Liam's car pulled up beside me. He rolled down the window and held out a single dollar bill, a smirk on his face. For the funeral expenses, he said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. I stared at him in disbelief, my grief giving way to pure, unadulterated rage. I snatched the dollar bill from his hand and crumpled it in my fist, my eyes blazing with fury. You bastard, I hissed. 
How dare you show your face here after everything you've done? How dare you disrespect my father's memory like this? Liam's smirk only widened. Oh, come on, Evelyn. It's just a joke. Lighten up a little. I shook my head, my voice trembling with anger. No, Liam, this is the last straw. I'm done with you, and I'm done with this marriage. I want a divorce. Liam's face hardened. Fine, but don't expect a penny from me, Evelyn. I'll make sure you end up with nothing. I laughed bitterly. I don't want your money, Liam. I want my life back, and I'm going to get it one way or another. With that, I turned and walked away, the crumpled dollar bill still clenched in my fist. I knew that the road ahead would be hard, but I also knew that I was strong enough to survive it. And I knew that I would make Liam pay for what he had done, no matter what it took. The weeks after Dad's funeral passed in a haze of grief and anger. I went through the motions of my daily life, but inside I was a wreck, consumed by thoughts of Liam's betrayal and my own desire for revenge. I knew that I couldn't let him get away with what he had done, but I didn't know where to start. One evening, as Olivia and I sat on my couch, sipping wine and trying to make sense of everything that had happened, she turned to me with a serious expression on her face. Evelyn, I've been thinking, she said. If Liam is really having an affair, we need to find out the truth. We need to hire a private investigator. I stared at her, my heart pounding in my chest. A private investigator? Liv, I don't know if I can afford that. Olivia shook her head. Don't worry about the money, Evelyn. I'll help you pay for it. This is important. We need to know what, what Liam is up to so we can use it against him in the divorce. I hesitated for a moment, then nodded slowly. Okay, let's do it. The next day, Olivia and I met with Jack, the private investigator she had found. He was a gruff, no-nonsense kind of guy, with a hard face and a piercing gaze. He listened carefully as I told him about Liam's behavior, about the late nights at work, and the secretive texts, and the way he had abandoned me at Dad's funeral. I'll look into it, Jack said when I had finished. If your husband is cheating on you, Mrs. Thompson, I'll find out, and I'll get you the evidence you need to nail his ass to the wall. I felt a surge of hope and determination at his words. Finally, someone was on my side. Someone who understood what I was going through and was willing to help me fight back. For the next two months, Jack worked tirelessly on my case, tailing Liam and gathering evidence of his affair. Every week, he would meet with me and Olivia, showing us photos and recordings of Liam and his mistress, a young woman named Sophia who worked at his company. I felt sick to my stomach every time I saw them together, laughing and touching and looking at each other with lust in their eyes. But I also felt a fierce sense of satisfaction, knowing that I had the proof I needed to destroy Liam once and for all. Finally, Jack called me with the news I'd been waiting for. Mrs. Thompson, I have everything I need, he said. Your husband has been having an affair with Sophia for months, and I have the evidence to prove it. It's time to confront him and take him down. I felt a rush of adrenaline at his words. This was it. This was my chance to make Liam pay for what he had done, to take back my life and my dignity. I called Olivia and told her the news, my voice shaking with excitement and nerves. It's time, Liv, I said. It's time to take that bastard down. Olivia let out a whoop of joy. Hell yes, it is. What's the plan? I took a deep breath, my mind racing with possibilities. And then it hit me. Liam's company was holding their annual gala in two weeks, a black tie event where he was set to receive a major award for his work. It was the perfect opportunity to expose him in front of all his colleagues and clients, to humiliate him the way he had humiliated me. The gala, I said, my voice steady and determined. We're going to confront him at the gala, in front of everyone. We're going to show them all what a lying, cheating scumbag he really is. Olivia was silent for a moment, then let out a low whistle. Damn, Evelyn, that's bold. Are you sure you're ready for that? I nodded, my jaw set with resolve. I'm ready, Liv. I'm done letting Liam control my life. It's time to take back what's mine and make him pay for what he's done, and I'm going to do it in front of the whole damn world. The day of the gala arrived, and I woke up with a sense of calm determination. This was it. This was the moment I had been waiting for, the chance to finally make Liam pay for what he had done. I spent the morning going over the evidence with Jack and Olivia, making sure we had everything we needed to take Liam down. As I got ready for the event, 
I couldn't help but feel a sense of nervous excitement. I had bought a stunning red dress for the occasion, one that hugged my curves and made me feel powerful and confident. I did my hair and makeup with care, wanting to look my absolute best when I confronted Liam in front of everyone. When I arrived at the gala, I was struck by the opulence of the event. The ballroom was decorated with glittering chandeliers and elaborate floral arrangements, and the guests were all dressed to the nines in tuxedos and gowns. I scanned the room, looking for Liam, and spotted him near the stage, chatting and laughing with a group of his colleagues. I made my way over to him, my heart pounding in my chest. As I approached, Liam turned and saw me, his eyes widening in surprise. Evelyn, he said, his voice tight. What are you doing here? I smiled coldly. I'm here to support my husband, of course. Isn't that what a good wife does? Liam's face hardened. I thought I made it clear that I didn't want you here tonight. I shrugged. Too bad. I have every right to be here, Liam. After all, we're still married, aren't we? Just then, I saw Sophia approaching from across the room, a smug smile on her face. She was wearing a tight black dress that left little to the imagination and I felt a surge of anger and disgust at the sight of her. Liam, darling, she purred, slipping her arm through his. Who's this? I stepped forward, my eyes blazing with fury. I'm his wife, you little slut, and I have something to say to both of you. Liam's face turned red with anger. Evelyn, don't you dare. But I cut him off, my voice ringing out loud and clear across the ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I have an important announcement to make. The room fell silent, and all eyes turned to me. I took a deep breath, then held up the folder of evidence that Jack had given me. My husband, Liam Thompson, has been having an affair with his co-worker Sophia for months. I have proof of their relationship, including photos, recordings, and witness statements. Liam has been lying to me, to his colleagues, and to his clients, and it's time for the truth to come out. There was a collective gasp from the crowd, and I saw Liam's face turn pale with shock and fear. Sophia's mouth dropped open, and she took a step back, her eyes darting around the room. I continued, my voice shaking with emotion. Liam, you have betrayed me in the worst possible way. You abandoned me when I needed you most, when I was grieving the loss of my father. You gave me a single dollar for his funeral expenses, like it was some kind of sick joke. And all the while you were sleeping with this woman behind my back, making a fool out of me in our marriage. I turned to Sophia, my eyes narrowed with contempt. And you, Sophia, how dare you come between a husband and wife? How dare you steal another woman's man and flaunt it in her face like it's something to be proud of? You're nothing but a homewrecker and a whore. The room erupted into chaos with people shouting and pointing and whispering to each other. I saw Liam's boss approaching, his face red with anger, and I knew that Liam's career was over. He would be fired, disgraced, and humiliated, just like he deserved. I turned to leave, my head held high, but Liam grabbed my arm, his fingers digging into my skin. You bitch, he hissed. You've ruined everything. I'll make you pay for this, I swear to God. I yanked my arm away, my eyes blazing with triumph. You already have, Liam. You ruined our marriage, our life together. And now I'm going to ruin you. Goodbye, Liam. I hope you rot in hell. And with that, I walked out of the ballroom, feeling like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I had done it. I had gotten my revenge. And I had taken back my life. And I knew that no matter what happened next, I would never let anyone hurt me like that again. The fallout from the gala was swift and brutal. Liam was fired from his job the next day, his reputation in tatters. His clients abandoned him, his colleagues shunned him, and his once promising career was reduced to ashes. I watched from a distance as he spiraled into despair, drowning his sorrows in alcohol and self-pity. But I had no sympathy for him. He had brought this on himself, with his lies and his betrayals and his cruelty. He had destroyed our marriage, our life together, and he deserved to suffer the consequences. I filed for divorce the next week, citing irreconcilable differences. Liam didn't even bother to contest it, too broken and defeated to put up a fight. I hired the best divorce attorney in town, determined to get every penny I was entitled to. In the end, I walked away with a generous settlement, including the house, the car, and a sizable chunk of Liam's assets. He was left with nothing but his shame and his regrets, 
a shell of the man he had once been. I moved into a new apartment, determined to start fresh and put the past behind me. Olivia helped me decorate, filling the space with bright colors and cheerful art. We spent long hours talking and laughing, marveling at how far I had come and how much I had overcome. But even as I tried to move on, Liam couldn't let go. He started calling me late at night, drunk and rambling, begging me to take him back. He showed up at my apartment, pounding on the door and screaming my name until the neighbors called the police. He sent me long, rambling emails, filled with apologies and promises and pleas for forgiveness. I deleted them all without reading them. My heart hardened against him. I had given him everything, and he had thrown it all away. I had no room in my life for his lies and his manipulations anymore. One day, as I was leaving my apartment, I found Liam waiting for me on the street, his eyes bloodshot and his clothes rumpled. He stumbled towards me, his hands outstretched, his voice slurred with drink. Evelyn, he mumbled. Please, I'm sorry. I know I messed up, I know I hurt you, but I love you. I need you. Please give me another chance. I stared at him, my eyes cold and unforgiving. You don't love me, Liam. You never did. You only loved yourself and what I could do for you. And now, you have nothing. No job, no money, no friends. You're pathetic. Liam's face crumpled and he fell to his knees, sobbing like a child. Please, Evelyn. I'll do anything. I'll change. I'll be better. Just don't leave me alone. I shook my head, my voice firm and unyielding. It's too late, Liam. You had your chance, and you blew it. I'm done with you. I'm moving on, and I'm never looking back. I stepped around him, my head held high, and walked away, leaving him crying on the sidewalk. I felt a sense of peace wash over me, a feeling of closure and resolution. I had faced my demons, and I had won. I was free. Months passed, and I settled into my new life. I focused on my job, my friends, and my own happiness. I started volunteering at a local women's shelter, helping other women who had been through similar struggles. I found a sense of purpose and fulfillment that I had never known before. And then, on the anniversary of my father's death, I visited his grave, a bouquet of flowers in my hand. I knelt down beside the headstone, my fingers tracing the letters of his name. I did it, Dad, I whispered. I got justice for you. I got justice for myself. And I'm going to be okay. I'm going to live my life to the fullest, just like you always wanted me to. I placed the flowers on the grave, then stood up, brushing the dirt from my knees. I took one last look at the headstone, then turned and walked away, my head held high, my heart full of hope and promise. I had survived the worst that life could throw at me, and I had come out stronger on the other side. And I knew that no matter what happened next, I would never let anyone break me again. I couldn't believe my eyes when I walked through the front door of my own home after our honeymoon. There, lounging on the sofa like they owned the place, were Doug's ex-wife Linda and their daughter Kristen. What are you two doing here? I demanded, my heart pounding. This was supposed to be the start of our new life together. Linda looked up from her magazine, her expression as cold as ice. Hello, dear. Doug said we could stay for a while. Kristen didn't even bother looking up from her phone. Yeah, he gave us keys and everything. I whirled around to face Doug, who had just entered from the kitchen. Is this true? You let them move in without even asking me? He had the decency to look sheepish. Marianne, they needed a place to stay for a little bit. I didn't think you'd mind. Not mind? I sputtered. This is our home, Doug, the home we're supposed to be starting our marriage in. Just the two of us. Linda skied loudly. Don't be so dramatic. It's just temporary until Kristen and I get back on our feet. You've been on your feet for thirty years, I shot back. I'm not having house guests, especially not ones who treat me like an intruder. Doug tried to placate me. Now, now, let's not fight in front of the ladies. We'll work something out. But I could see it in his eyes. He had no intention of making them leave. This was my life now an endless hostage situation with his insufferable former family. Kristen finally looked up, smirking at me. If you can't handle a little company, maybe you shouldn't have married Dad. The cruel jab stung, but I refused to show weakness in front of her. Squaring my shoulders, I said evenly, You're right, Kristen, which is why I'm leaving until they're gone for good. Marianne! Doug protested, finally showing a flicker of concern. But I was already heading for the stairs to pack a bag. 
As I threw clothes into a suitcase, I could hear Linda's shrill laughter floating up from below. I told you she was too high strung for you, Doug. This marriage won't last. Tears pricked my eyes, but I blinked them away fiercely. After everything I'd been through in my life, I wouldn't let them see me crumble. I was Marianne Stevens, and for the first time in decades, I was putting myself first. I stormed out of the house, suitcase in hand, trying to ignore Doug's feeble protests behind me. How could he do this to me? To us? After everything we'd been through to finally be together, he was letting his insufferable ex-wife and her brat of a daughter walk all over our marriage. My friend Susan didn't even blink when I showed up on her doorstep, red-faced and furious. Come in, honey, she said, wrapping me in a warm hug. Want to tell me what that bastard did this time? As I vented about Linda and Kristen's unannounced arrival, Susan's face grew thunderous. The nerve of them, inviting themselves into your home like that, and Doug just rolled over as usual, I'm guessing? Nodding miserably, I sank onto her plush sofa. He claims it's just temporary, but you know how he is. Once they get their hooks in, they'll never leave. Well, you're welcome to stay here as long as you need, Susan said firmly. Lord knows I've had my fair share of unwanted house guests thanks to Carl's idiot family. I managed a watery smile, grateful for her steadfast friendship over the decades. While our husbands came and went, taking us for granted, Susan and I had been each other's constants. Over the next few days, I tried to make the best of my sudden displacement, but it wasn't easy. Everywhere I looked in Susan's cozy home, I was reminded of happier times— Photos of her and Carl on vacation, little mementos from her grandkids. My own dreams of a blissful new chapter with Doug, growing old together, seemed to be crumbling. You know, I saw Doug at the grocery store yesterday, Susan mentioned one evening as we watched mindless TV. He looked miserable. I snorted. Yeah, well, he made his bed. Let him lie in it with the she-devils. Don't you think you're being a tad harsh, dear? She gave me a pointed look. After all, you did marry the man bristling, I shot back. And he married me, not them. We're supposed to be starting fresh, just the two of us. But no, he has to let his parasite family suck him dry as usual. Susan held up a placating hand. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. You know I'm on your side. But maybe once you've both cooled off, you can have an actual conversation about boundaries? I knew she was right, as much as it pained me to admit it. As infuriating as Doug could be, Shutting him out completely wouldn't solve anything. I'd have to go back eventually and stand my ground. Little did I know, the war was only just beginning. Because when I did return home, I discovered just how far Linda and Kristen were willing to go to make my life a living hell. After a few days of licking my wounds at Susan's place, I knew I had to go back and face the music. As much as Doug had hurt me by letting Linda and Kristen invade our home, running away wouldn't solve anything. I was determined to stand my ground. I steeled myself as I pulled into the driveway, half expecting Linda to be waiting on the porch like a vulture. But the house was quiet, almost eerily so. Taking a deep breath, I unlocked the door and stepped inside. Hello? I called out tentatively. Doug? It's me. No answer. Frowning, I wandered further into the living room. That's when I noticed it. My mother's antique locket lying haphazardly on the coffee table, the delicate chain tangled. A wave of fury washed over me as I snatched it up, cradling the precious heirloom in my palm. How dare they treat something so precious with such careless disrespect? The sound of giggling from the kitchen made me spin around. Kristen stood there, smirking at me over a glass of wine. There you are, she said airily. We were wondering when you'd be back to clean up after us. I live here, I shot back, clutching the locket tightly. Unlike you. Now where is your mother? Kristen shrugged, taking another sip. Out with Dad, doing whatever. You know how they are. Of course I did. Linda had always been able to wrap Doug around her manicured finger, even after their divorce. I felt a pang of hurt that he was out gallivanting with her instead of at home with his new wife. Well, while you're here as my unwanted guest, I said through gritted teeth, I'll thank you not to touch my personal belongings, especially things that were my mother's. Kristen's eyes danced with cruel amusement. What this old thing? She nodded at the locket. I was just trying it on. No need to get your granny panties in a twist. My temper flared, but I refused to rise to her juvenile taunts. It's not yours to borrow or try on or whatever, 
It's mine. Do you understand? My private property that you have no right to. Geez, okay, Kristen rolled her eyes exaggeratedly. I was just having some fun, but whatever. No need to bite my head off, step monster. The mocking jab stung, but I refused to show it. Clutching the locket protectively, I brushed past her toward the stairs. That's right. Go pout in your room, she called after me. Leave the fun to the real ladies of the house. I could hear her laughter echoing behind me as I hurried up to the bedroom, fighting back angry tears. This was my home, my sanctuary, and they were determined to make me feel like an outcast. As I gently laid the locket back in its usual place on my dresser, I could almost feel my mother's calming presence. She had been such a strong, dignified woman, always keeping her head held high even in the face of adversity. I needed to be more like her, I realized. To stop cowering and letting Linda and Kristen run roughshod over me with their cruelty. If Doug was too weak to stand up to them, then I would have to be the strong one, because this was my home, my rules, and if they refused to respect that, then they could get out. No more Mrs. Nice Newlywed. From now on, they'd be dealing with a very different Marianne. After my confrontation with Kristen, I resolved to stop letting Linda and her daughter walk all over me. This was my home, my marriage, and if Doug wasn't going to stand up for me, then I would have to stand up for myself. The next morning, I marched into the kitchen to find Linda sipping coffee and reading the newspaper like she owned the place. We need to talk, I said firmly. She looked up, one perfectly arched eyebrow raised. Well, good morning to you too, dear. Refusing to be cowed by her condescending tone, I plowed ahead. This living situation isn't working for me. You and Kristen have overstepped far too many boundaries. Linda set down her mug with an audible clink. Excuse me? We're Doug's family. This is our home as much as yours. No, it's not, I shot back. It's my home that I share with my husband. You're just guests here, whether Doug wants to admit it or not. She laughed derisively. Is that what he told you? Oh, Marianne, you really are a naive little thing, aren't you? The belittling way she said my name made my blood boil, but I kept my temper in check. I don't care what Doug has or hasn't said. This is between you and me now. If you two can't respect me and my home, then I want you out. For a moment, Linda looked almost impressed at my boldness. Then her expression hardened. You don't have that authority here. This is still Doug's house, and he'll never kick us out, you mark my words. We'll see about that, I said grimly. I'm putting my foot down on this, Linda. The disrespect ends now. She rose from her chair, eyes glittering with malice. Or what? You'll cry and pout until you get your way, like the spoiled brat you are. The insult stung, but I refused to rise to her taunts. Lifting my chin defiantly, I said, I'm going to give Doug an ultimatum. It's them or me, and if he picks you again, then our marriage is over for good. A cruel smile curved Linda's red lips. An ultimatum? How delightfully dramatic of you, but you're only digging your own grave, Marianne. Doug will never choose you over his family. That's what you think, I said, turning on my heel. But you're about to get a rude awakening. As I left the kitchen, I could hear her mocking laughter following me. But this time... It didn't make me want to cry. It only strengthened my resolve. Linda thought she had me all figured out, but she was wrong. Dead wrong. Because for the first time since meeting Doug, I was seeing the full truth. He was nothing but a weak, spineless man completely controlled by his manipulative ex-wife. And I was done being a doormat. When Doug came home that evening, I didn't give him a chance to take off his coat before laying into him. We need to talk. I said, arms crossed. This living situation with Linda and Kristen, it's over, as of today. He blinked owlishly at me. Marianne, I know it's been hard having them here, but it's only temporary. No, I cut him off. It's not temporary, it's permanent unless I put a stop to it. They've invaded our home, our marriage, and you've just let it happen. Doug's face reddened. Now hold on, they're my family, and I'm your wife, I shouted, finally letting my anger and hurt pour out. Or at least, I'm supposed to be. How could you let them treat me this way, like some intruder in my own home? He opened and closed his mouth, looking utterly befuddled, pathetic. It's them or me, Doug, I said, lowering my voice to an icy calm. You either put your foot down and get them out of here, or I'm leaving for good this time. No more second chances. For a long moment he simply gaped at me. Then, finally, Marianne, 
You can't be serious. I felt something inside me harden at the weakness in his voice. This man who was supposed to be my partner would never put me first. Not really. I've never been more serious in my life, I said quietly. The choice is yours. As I turned and walked away, leaving him to make his decision, I realized this was about more than just winning a battle against Linda. This was about reclaiming my self-respect, my sense of self-worth that had been slowly chipped away. One way or another I was done being a victim. Either Doug manned up and took my side, or I walked away from this toxic situation for good. The choice was his. But the power? That was all mine now. After giving Doug my ultimatum, I waited with bated breath to see what he would do. A big part of me didn't have much hope. He was so spineless when it came to Linda and Kristen, always putting their wants above my needs as his wife. But I had to try, one last time, to make him see reason. The next few days were tense, to say the least. Doug avoided me as much as possible, no doubt dreading having to actually make a difficult decision for once in his life. Meanwhile, Linda and Kristen swanned around the house, smug as can be, clearly thinking they had already won. I refused to be cowed, though. I started packing up my belongings just in case and making preparations to move out if needed. My friend Susan was ready with a spare room, and I knew my son Nathan would support me too. Finally, after nearly a week of agonizing silence, Doug approached me in the kitchen. His expression was pinched, miserable. Marianne, he began heavily. I've given this a lot of thought. I crossed my arms, tensing for the blow I feared was coming. And? He sighed, not quite meeting my eyes. I just... I can't kick Linda and Kristen out. They're my family. White-hot fury lanced through me, but I kept my expression stony. I'm your family now, too, in case you've forgotten. Your wife. I know, I know. Doug ran a hand through his thinning hair. But they have nowhere else to go. Linda's finances are... Well... They're not great, Fry, and Kristen just got laid off from her job. Of course, the poor, helpless victims who always needed rescuing from dear old dad. I felt disgusted, both with them and with Doug's transparent excuses. So that's it, then, I said, voice shaking despite my best efforts. You're choosing them over me, over our marriage? He flinched at the hurt in my tone. Marianne, please, it's not that simple. It is that simple, I exploded, finally losing my temper. It's them or me, just like I said, and you've made your choice loud and clear. Doug opened his mouth, but I didn't let him get another word out. Don't bother trying to explain or backpedal, I said, jabbing a finger at his chest. I'm done being second fiddle to your parasite family. From now on, you can support them yourself since they're so helpless. His eyes went wide. What, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm leaving, I said, my voice hardening with resolve. For good this time, I should have listened to my instincts from the start instead of marrying someone so weak and spineless. Doug sputtered incoherently, but I brushed past him, heading for the stairs to finish packing. As I went, I caught a glimpse of Linda and Kristen hovering in the hallway, identical smug smiles on their faces. Have fun with your new roommates, I tossed over my shoulder. You've more than earned them. Kristen's grin only widened. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, step monster. I didn't bother responding, just kept climbing the stairs with my head held high. I was finally free of their toxic web, no longer letting them manipulate and control me. As I packed up the last of my things, tucking my mother's locket safely away, I felt a strange sense of peace wash over me. This was the right decision, the only decision that preserved my self-respect. When I came back downstairs, suitcase in hand, Doug was waiting for me, with red-rimmed eyes. Marianne, please, he said hoarsely. Don't go. We can, we can work this out. I shook my head, amazed at his deluded optimism even now. It's too late for that, Doug. You made your choice. Then I brushed past him, out the door and into the brisk evening air, leaving my disastrous marriage behind without a second glance. As I climbed into my car, I caught sight of Nathan's number on my phone. A sad smile tugged at my lips as I hit call. It was time to go stay with my son for a while, regroup and plan my next move. This was a new beginning, as painful as it was, and for the first time in a long time, I felt free. After leaving Doug and that toxic situation behind, I felt equal parts liberated and adrift. On one hand, I was finally free of the manipulation and disrespect. But on the other, I was now 62 years old, 
and essentially starting over from scratch. Thankfully, I had my son Nathan to lean on during those first few difficult weeks. He welcomed me into his humble apartment with open arms, no questions asked. I'm just glad you finally saw the light about that idiot, he said bluntly as I unpacked my meager belongings. Doug was a leech from the start. I managed a rueful smile. You were right all along. I should have listened to you instead of letting his charm blind me. Nathan shrugged, wrapping an arm around my shoulders. What's done is done, Mom. Now it's time to focus on you for once, instead of some deadbeat husband. His words resonated deeply. For most of my adult life, I had defined myself through the men in my world. First my late husband, then Doug. But who was I really, outside of being someone's wife? It was time to rediscover Marianne, the strong, resilient woman who had survived so much already. With Nathan's encouragement, I started looking for jobs to get back into editing, my former career before retirement. It felt wonderful to dust off those long-neglected skills, to lose myself in the familiar rhythm of fact-checking and line edits. Within a month, I had landed a few decent freelance gigs to bring in some income. It wasn't much, but it was mine, money I had earned completely independently of any man. I'm proud of you, Mom, Nathan said simply when I shared the news. Those four words meant more to me than he could possibly know. Slowly but surely, I began rebuilding my sense of self-worth. No longer was I the woman who had been betrayed and belittled by her husband's family. I was a self-sufficient career woman, paying her own way and holding her head high. Of course, it wasn't all smooth sailing. There were days when the loneliness and heartbreak over my failed marriage threatened to overwhelm me. I missed having a true partner, someone to share my life with. But I refused to rebound recklessly, to repeat the same mistakes. I needed to be whole and happy on my own, first, before even considering letting someone new into my life. In those darker moments, I would take out my mother's locket, the one Kristen had so carelessly tossed aside, and find strength in running my fingers over the tarnished gold links. This heirloom was a reminder that I came from a long line of resilient women who had endured and overcome their own struggles. If they could persevere, so could I. The months passed in a blur of work, time with Nathan, and the occasional social outing with my friend Susan. Slowly, steadily, the gaping wound of my divorce scabbed over and began to heal. Then, one sunny afternoon while I was editing in the local park, my phone rang. It was a number I didn't recognize, but I answered anyway. Marianne, it's Doug. I stiffened at the sound of his voice, equal parts angry and caught off guard. Part of me wanted to immediately hang up, to sever that tie completely. But another part, a deeper part, knew I owed it to myself to hear him out one last time. To slam the door decisively instead of leaving it cracked open. What do you want, Doug? I asked evenly, proud of how steady I kept my voice. There was an audible exhale on the other end of the line, as if he'd been stealing himself for this conversation. Marianne, I... I made a terrible mistake. The biggest mistake of my life and I need you to know how sorry I am. I said nothing, simply listening as he plowed ahead. Linda and Kristen, they... They took advantage of me in ways I didn't even realize at first. Financially, emotionally, you were right about them all along, and I let them completely ruin what we had because I was too weak to stand up to them. Doug's voice grew thicker with emotion, but I refused to let myself feel sorry for him. Not yet. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I need you to know that I see the truth now, and I'm working on being a better, stronger man for me, not for anyone else. You deserved so much better than what I gave you, Marianne, and I hope someday you can find the happiness you deserve. The line went silent then. I could have responded, could have unleashed all the pent-up hurt and anger I'd been carrying around for months, but in that moment I realized I didn't need to. Doug's words, his obvious regret— it was enough. Because for the first time since our marriage fell apart, I felt completely free of him. No anger, no sadness, no lingering doubts. Just peace. So instead of yelling or rehashing old wounds, I simply said, Thank you for calling, Doug. I wish you the best. And then I hung up the phone, a small but serene smile on my face as I turned my attention back to my work. Another chapter was closed, making way for whatever came next. And this time, I had no doubts. The best was yet to come. A few months after Doug's apologetic phone call, 
I was settled into my new routine as a self-sufficient single woman. The editing jobs were keeping me busy and the income, while modest, was enough to cover my humble apartment's rent. For the first time in years, I was standing on my own two feet financially. Nathan and I had grown even closer in the wake of my divorce, bonding over our mutual disdain for Doug's spinelessness. We made a point to have a mother-son dinner at least once a week to catch up. You seem good, Mom. Really good, he said over plates of pasta one night, studying me with an appraising eye. This independent life looks good on you, I smiled, warmed by his words. I am good, Nathan. Better than I've been in a long time, if I'm being honest. He nodded approvingly. That's what I like to hear. No deadweight ex-husbands dragging you down anymore. Speaking of deadweights, I said slowly, I actually got an interesting call from Doug last week. Nathan's easygoing expression clouded over. Oh, yeah? What did that weasel want? Briefly, I recounted Doug's apology, his admission that Linda and Kristen had been using him financially, that he was trying to be a better man now, but understood if I could never forgive him. To my surprise, Nathan didn't immediately launch into a diatribe against his former stepfather. Instead, he was silent for a long moment, seemingly digesting it all. Finally, he said, Well, isn't that a kick in the pants, the great Doug, brought low by his own selfish family? I know, I said with a rueful chuckle, a real case of karma finally catching up with him. So, Nathan fixed me with an intent look. How did it feel, hearing him grovel like that? I considered the question carefully. How had I felt in that moment when the man who had betrayed and belittled me was reduced to begging for my forgiveness? Honestly, it felt empowering, I said slowly, like I was finally getting the apology and admission I deserved all along, but it didn't make me angry or bitter anymore, just at peace. Nathan's mouth curved into a small smile of approval. Good, you're way too good for him, Mom. He's the one who should be haunted by what he threw away. His words resonated deeply, because in that moment, I realized that was exactly what this was, my long-awaited revenge against Doug and his wretched family, not through shouting or cruelty, but simply by rising above it all with grace and dignity, by rebuilding my life into something stronger, by refusing to be a victim anymore. While Doug was left to grovel and drown in the consequences of his own poor choices, I was thriving, embracing my independence rediscovering my strength, surrounding myself with people who truly loved me. That was the ultimate revenge, not needing him at all anymore. Over the following weeks, I couldn't help but revel in my newfound freedom a little. I went out to dinners with Susan, took a weekend trip to the beach on a whim, and even reconnected with a few old friends from my college days. My life was full in a way it hadn't been in decades, unburdened by the toxicity of Doug and his family. And if the occasional rumor about their downward spiral reached my ears, well, I didn't deny the petty sense of satisfaction it brought. Apparently, without me as his meal ticket, Doug's finances had tanked spectacularly. Linda and Kristen were furious, of course, but their anger was meaningless to me now. They had made their greedy beds, and now they could lie in them. As for me, I had reclaimed my power, my self-worth, and I had no intentions of ever letting another person take that away from me again. When Susan asked one day if I had any regrets about the whole Doug situation, I didn't even have to think before answering. Not a single one, I said with a serene smile. Leaving him was the best decision I ever made. And in that moment, I knew it was true. The woman I was now, confident, self-assured, in control of her own destiny, was worth all the heartache and struggle it took to get here. My rebirth, my renewal, my ultimate revenge, it was all worth it. Over a year had passed since I walked out on Doug and his toxic family, and my life had blossomed in ways I never could have imagined. The freelance editing jobs were keeping me comfortable, if not wealthy, and I had rekindled so many old friendships that had fallen by the wayside during my marriage. But easily the brightest spark in my newfound independence was an unexpected reconnection from my distant past. My high school sweetheart, Mark. We had dated all through those carefree teenage years before ultimately going our separate ways after graduation. Mark had joined the military while I headed off to college, and we had eventually lost touch amid the busyness of adulthood. Then, one sunny afternoon, I logged onto Facebook to see a friend request from a vaguely familiar name. 
Curious, I opened it to find a message from none other than Mark himself. Mary Ann? It's me, Mark Patterson, your prom date from Westview High? I know it's been forever, but I was hoping we could catch up. I stared at the words on the screen, a wave of nostalgia crashing over me. Of course, how could I have forgotten those bright hazel eyes, that warm, crooked smile? We may have lost contact over the decades, but those memories came rushing back like they were yesterday. On a whim, I accepted the request and sent a message back, and just like that, we were off and running, trading stories about our lives, reminiscing about old times, and flirting with an easy familiarity despite all the years apart. A few weeks of messaging turned into exchanging phone numbers, which turned into hours-long conversations that kept me smiling like a love-struck teenager again. Mark had a way of making me feel cherished, valued, the way a good partner should. Finally, we made plans to meet up for coffee and catch up in person. I spent far too long fretting over what to wear before forcing myself to take a breath. This was Mark, the boy who had once loved me for my quirks, not in spite of them. When I saw him waiting at the cafe, hair more silver than blonde but eyes still bright with warmth, it was like no time had passed at all. We hugged, exchanged giddy you haven't aged a day compliments, and immediately fell into an easy rapport over steaming mugs. For hours we laughed and reminisced, picking up like we'd never been apart. I told him all about my disastrous marriage to Doug, the betrayal and heartache that had ultimately set me free, and he shared his own stories of loves lost and found over the years, including a painful divorce of his own. I always wondered what happened to you, Marianne, he said at one point, covering my hand with his calloused palm. Part of me always hoped our paths would cross again someday. I felt a flutter in my chest at his tender words, at the open affection in his gaze. This was what true connection felt like. Honest, comfortable, cherished. Nothing like the manipulation and toxicity I'd endured with Doug. From that first meeting, Mark effortlessly wove himself back into my life like he had never left. We went on proper dates, dinners, movies, long walks through the park reliving our youth. With each outing, I felt lighter and happier than I had in years. My friends and family adored Mark, charmed by his old-fashioned courtship and ability to make me smile so freely. Even cynical Nathan had to admit, he's a major upgrade from Doug, that's for sure. In Mark's company, I was able to completely shed the insecurities and doubts that my failed marriage had instilled. He valued me for who I was, respected the boundaries I set, and never once made me feel like a burden or afterthought. This was the real love I had been searching for all along, passionate yet stable, challenging but supportive, a true partnership of equals built on years of history and hard-won wisdom. The first time Mark told me he loved me, I didn't hesitate before saying it back because in my heart I knew this was the redemption I deserved after so much heartache. A love that filled my soul instead of diminishing it. Of course, I couldn't help but revel in the delicious irony that while Doug was left to grovel and flounder in the wake of his selfishness, I had reclaimed everything. My independence, my confidence, and ultimately, a love that made me deliriously happy. As Mark and I strode hand in hand through the sunshine one brilliant spring day, I caught a glimpse of my radiant smile reflected in a storefront window. In that moment, I made a silent vow to never let anyone tarnish my light again. This was my season, my rebirth, my renaissance, and I had no intentions of letting it or this profound love slip through my fingers. The phone vibrates in my purse as I sit in the front pew, tears streaming down my face. My sister's casket gleams under the church lights, her portrait smiling serenely beside it. I know it's Greg calling without even looking. He's been blowing up my phone since I left for the funeral this morning, demanding I come home to play hostess for his family gathering. I step outside to answer, bracing myself. Where the hell are you? Greg snarls through the phone. You need to leave that funeral right now and get back here. My mother and cousins are waiting. Greg? Please, I whisper, my voice shaking. It's my sister's funeral. I need to be here for my family. I don't care. You have responsibilities at home. If you're not back here in an hour, don't bother coming back at all. I'll send you divorce papers tomorrow. The call ends abruptly. I lean against the cold stone wall, my body trembling. Ten years of marriage to Greg, and it's come to this. Threats and ultimatums on the day I bury my sister. 
I think back to how we met in college, how he swept me off my feet with grand romantic gestures. I was young and naive, mistaking his possessiveness for love. Soon after our wedding, he convinced me to quit my job and become a housewife, while his domineering mother Janice constantly criticized my every move. Slowly, insidiously, they chipped away at my confidence and independence. The church doors creak open and my brother-in-law Steve emerges. Lana? Is everything okay? I shake my head, fresh tears spilling over. Steve puts a comforting arm around my shoulders as I pour out the details of Greg's latest threat. This isn't right, Steve says firmly. No one should be treated this way, especially by their husband. You need to put your foot down with Greg. How? He controls everything, the money, the house, and he'll turn our son against me if I try to leave, just like his mother did to him. Steve looks me straight in the eye. Lana, listen to me. You are stronger than you know. Don't let them bully you anymore, if not for yourself, then for Mason. He needs you to stand up and show him this isn't normal or okay. I let out a shuddering breath. Deep down, I know Steve is right. For years, I've made excuses, hoping Greg would change. But the cycle of control and cruelty only gets worse. I think of my bright, sweet boy and my heart clenches. I can't let him grow up thinking this is what a marriage should be. I'll try, I promise Steve. I don't know how but I'll try to be strong, for Mason and for myself. As we walk back into the church, I square my shoulders, preparing for the battle ahead. Confronting Greg and Janice won't be easy, but for the first time in a decade, I feel a flicker of determination amid the fear. I will find a way to break free, no matter what it takes. For my son and for the woman I used to be, the one I'm slowly discovering still exists beneath the years of oppression. This is just the beginning. After the funeral, I find myself lingering in the church parking lot, dreading the confrontation waiting for me at home. Steve approaches, his brow furrowed with concern. Lana, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation with Greg earlier, he says. The way he spoke to you, it's not right. No one deserves to be treated like that. I avert my gaze, shame burning in my throat. It's fine, Steve. I'm used to it. But you shouldn't be, he insists. Lana, I know it's not my place, but I care about you, and I can see how much you're hurting. You need to stand up for yourself. Tears sting my eyes. I don't know how. Greg, he, he controls everything. The money, the house. He's even threatened to turn our son against me if I try to leave. Steve's jaw clenches. That's not love, Lana. That's abuse. You deserve so much better. His words hit me like a punch to the gut. Deep down, I've always known the truth but hearing someone else say it out loud makes it impossible to ignore. I'm scared, I whisper. Greg and his mother, they've broken me down for so long. I don't know if I have the strength to fight back. Steve places a hand on my shoulder, his eyes fierce with determination. You're stronger than you think, and you don't have to do this alone. I'm here for you, and I know your family will support you too. I take a deep, shaky breath. Thank you, Steve. I don't know what I'd do without you. You've got this, Lana, one step at a time, and remember, you're not just doing this for yourself, you're doing it for Mason, too. His words echo in my mind as I drive home, my heart pounding in my chest. He's right. I can't let my son grow up thinking this is normal. I have to be strong, for both of us. When I pull into the driveway, Greg is waiting on the porch, his face twisted with anger. Janice hovers behind him, her lips pursed in disapproval. Where the hell have you been? Greg demands as I climb out of the car. I told you to come home hours ago. I square my shoulders, meeting his gaze head on. I was at my sister's funeral, Greg, where I needed to be. Needed to be, he scoffs. What about what I need? What about your responsibilities here? I have a responsibility to my family, too, I say, my voice trembling slightly, and I'm done letting you control every aspect of my life. Greg's eyes narrow. What did you just say to me? I take a step forward, my heart hammering against my ribs. I want a divorce, Greg. I can't live like this anymore. Rage contorts his features. You ungrateful bitch, he snarls, raising his hand as if to strike me. I flinch, bracing for the blow, but it doesn't come. Instead, Janice steps forward, her voice dripping with venom. If you even think about leaving, I'll make sure you never see your son again, she hisses. I'll turn him against you so fast your head will spin. Fear claws at my throat, but I force myself to stand my ground. No, you won't. 
I won't let you poison him the way you've poisoned Greg. Greg's face reddens with fury. You're not going anywhere, he growls. You're nothing without me, do you understand? Nothing. I look him straight in the eye, a newfound strength surging through me. You're wrong, Greg. I'm everything without you, and I'm done being your punching bag. With that, I turn on my heel and march inside, slamming the door behind me. My hands shake as I lean against it, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I know this is just the beginning. Greg and Janice won't let me go without a fight. But for the first time in years, I feel a flicker of hope amid the fear. I'm ready to take my life back, no matter what it takes. The moment I step inside the house, Greg is on me like a rabid dog. He grabs my arm, his fingers digging into my skin hard enough to leave bruises. You think you can just walk away? He snarls, his face inches from mine. After everything I've done for you? I try to pull away, but his grip only tightens. Let go of me, Greg. Not until you come to your senses. You're not leaving me, Lana. I won't allow it. Janice appears in the doorway, her arms crossed over her chest. You should be grateful Greg ever married you in the first place, she sneers. Who else would want a pathetic, useless woman like you? Anger flares in my chest, hot and bright. I'm not useless, I snap, and I'm not going to let you treat me like this anymore. Greg barks out a harsh laugh. Oh, really? And what are you going to do, huh? You have no money, no job, no skills. You're nothing without me. I wrench my arm out of his grasp, my skin throbbing. I'll figure it out. Anything is better than living like this. Janice steps forward, her eyes glittering with malice. If you even think about leaving, I'll make sure you never see Mason again. I'll tell him what a selfish, horrible mother you are. He'll hate you forever. My stomach twists at the thought of losing my son. You can't do that. The courts won't let you. Courts? Greg scoffs. You really think you can afford a lawyer? I control all the money, remember? And I'll make sure you don't see a dime. Fear claws at my throat, but I force myself to stand tall. I have friends, family. They'll help me. Janice laughs, cold and cruel. Your family? They've never approved of you, Lana. They think you're a failure. And your friends? What friends? We're all you have. Tears sting my eyes, but I blink them back. I won't let them see me break. That's not true. I have people who care about me, who believe in me. Greg's face twists with rage. You ungrateful bitch, he spits. After everything I've given you, this is how you repay me? By tearing our family apart? You tore this family apart the moment you laid hands on me, I say, my voice shaking. The moment you decided your ego was more important than your wife and child. Greg's hand shoots out, grabbing me by the throat. I gasp, clawing at his fingers as he slams me against the wall. You're not going anywhere, he growls, his breath hot against my face. You belong to me. Do you understand? You'll never escape me. Black spots dance in my vision as I struggle for air. Just as I'm about to pass out, Greg releases me, letting me crumple to the floor. Get out of my sight, he snarls, and if you ever try to leave again, I'll make you regret it. I stagger to my feet, my throat burning with every breath. Janice smirks at me as I stumble past her, her eyes gleaming with triumph. I make it to the bedroom before I break down, sobs tearing from my chest. I bury my face in my hands, my whole body shaking with the force of my grief. How did I let it get this far? How did I let them break me down so completely? But even as despair threatens to swallow me whole, a tiny spark of defiance flickers in my chest. They may have beaten me down, but they haven't broken me. Not yet. I think of Mason, of the bright, beautiful boy who deserves so much better than this. I think of my sister, of the strength and courage she always saw in me, even when I couldn't see it myself. I may be trapped, but I'm not helpless. I'll find a way out of this, no matter what it takes. For Mason, for myself, for the life I know we both deserve. Greg and Janice have underestimated me for the last time. They think they can control me, but they're wrong. I'm done being their victim. It's time to fight back. The next morning, I slip out of the house before Greg and Janice wake up my heart pounding in my chest. I drive to a nearby coffee shop and pull out my phone with shaking hands. I scroll through my contacts until I find Olivia's number. She's a divorce lawyer and an old friend of my sister's. I hesitate for a moment, fear twisting in my gut. What if she doesn't believe me? What if she thinks I'm overreacting? I take a deep breath and hit the call button. Olivia answers on the second ring, her voice warm and friendly. Lana, it's been a while. 
How are you holding up? I swallow hard, tears stinging my eyes. Olivia, I need your help. I want to leave Greg, but he's threatening to take my son away from me. There's a pause on the other end of the line. Lana, are you safe right now? Is Greg with you? No, I'm alone. But he's been, he's been abusive, Olivia, physically and emotionally, and his mother is just as bad. They've been controlling every aspect of my life for years. Olivia's voice is gentle but firm. Lana, I'm so sorry you're going through this, but you're doing the right thing by reaching out for help. No one deserves to be treated that way. Relief washes over me, so strong it nearly knocks me off my feet. Thank you, Olivia. I didn't know who else to turn to. You did the right thing, she assures me. Now, here's what we're going to do. I want you to start documenting everything. The abuse, the threats, the financial control. Keep a journal, take photos of any injuries, save any threatening messages or emails. I nod, even though she can't see me. Okay, I can do that. Good. And I'm going to start putting together an escape plan for you and Mason. We'll need to be careful, but I promise you, Lana, we'll get you out of there. Tears spill down my cheeks. Thank you, Olivia. I don't know how I'll ever repay you. You don't have to repay me, she says firmly. Just focus on staying safe and gathering evidence. I'll handle the rest. We hang up a few minutes later, and I sit in my car, my mind racing. I know documenting the abuse won't be easy. Greg is careful not to leave visible marks, and Janice is a master at twisting my words against me. But I also know I can't keep living like this. I can't let Mason grow up thinking this is normal, that this is what love looks like. I drive home in a daze, my heart hammering in my chest. When I walk through the front door, Greg is waiting for me, his eyes narrowed with suspicion. Where were you? he demands, his voice low and dangerous. I force myself to meet his gaze, my chin lifted defiantly. I went for a drive, I needed some air. He takes a step towards me, his fists clenched at his sides. You didn't think to ask permission first? Anger flares in my chest, hot and bright. I don't need your permission to leave the house, Greg. I'm not your prisoner. His face twists with rage, and for a moment I think he's going to hit me. But instead, he grabs my arm, his fingers digging into my skin. You're my wife, he snarls. You'll do as I say, or there will be consequences. I wrench my arm out of his grasp, my heart pounding. I'm not afraid of you anymore, Greg, and I'm not going to let you control me any longer. With that, I turn on my heel and march upstairs, slamming the bedroom door behind me. My hands shake as I pull out my phone and start typing up everything that just happened. It's not much, but it's a start. A tiny crack in the facade of our perfect marriage, a glimmer of hope in the darkness. I know the road ahead won't be easy. Greg and Janice will fight me every step of the way, will try to break me down until there's nothing left. But I also know I'm not alone anymore. I have Olivia in my corner, and the truth on my side. And for the first time in years, I feel something stirring in my chest. A flicker of strength, of determination. I'm ready to take my life back, one piece at a time, and heaven help anyone who tries to stop me. Over the next few weeks, I pour all my energy into documenting Greg's abuse and gathering evidence of his financial misconduct. I take photos of the bruises on my arms, save threatening voicemails and emails, and keep a detailed journal of every incident. But the more I stand up for myself, the more volatile Greg becomes. He flies into rages over the smallest things, smashing dishes and punching holes in the walls. Janice only adds fuel to the fire, whispering poisonous words in his ear and reminding me of my place. One evening I come home from a meeting with Olivia to find Greg waiting for me in the living room, a cruel smile on his face. I've been doing some thinking, he says, his voice deceptively calm, and I've decided you don't need a car anymore, or a phone, for that matter. My stomach drops. What are you talking about? He holds up my keys and my cell phone, dangling them in front of me like a cat toying with a mouse. I'm cutting you off, Lana. No more sneaking around behind my back. No more secret meetings with your little friends. Panic rises in my throat. Greg, you can't do this. I need my car to take Mason to school, to run errands, and my phone is my only lifeline. He laughs, cold and cruel. You don't need a lifeline. You have me, remember? I'm all you need. Rage boils up inside me, hot and fierce. Give me my keys and my phone, Greg. Now. His eyes flash with anger, and he takes a step towards me. Or what? 
What are you going to do, Lana? Run crying to your lawyer friend? Go ahead. Tell her how I'm such a monster for trying to keep my family together. I stand my ground, my heart pounding in my chest. Olivia knows the truth, Greg. She knows exactly what kind of man you are, and she's going to help me leave you, no matter what it takes. His face twists with rage, and he grabs me by the shoulders, shaking me hard. You're not going anywhere, do you hear me? You're mine, Lana. Mine. I shove him away, my whole body trembling. I'm not your property, Greg. I'm a human being, with my own thoughts and feelings and desires, and I'm done letting you control me. He stares at me for a long moment, his eyes dark with fury. Then he turns and storms out of the room, slamming the door behind him. I sink to the floor, my legs giving out beneath me. Tears stream down my face as I wrap my arms around myself, trying to hold myself together. I know I can't back down now. Greg will never let me go willingly, will never admit to his own cruelty and abuse. If I want to be free, I'll have to fight for it with everything I have. The next day I meet with the private investigator Olivia hired to look into Greg's financial dealings. He hands me a thick folder, his face grim. It's all there, he says. Bank statements, emails, recordings of phone calls. Your husband has been embezzling money from his company for years, funneling it into offshore accounts. I flip through the pages, my heart racing. With this evidence, I can not only secure a divorce, but also make sure Greg faces the consequences of his actions. I thank the investigator and head home, the folder tucked safely in my purse. When I walk through the front door, Greg is waiting for me, his face twisted with suspicion. Where have you been? He demands. I meet his gaze head on, my chin lifted defiantly. I was taking care of some business. Business that's going to change everything, Greg. His eyes narrow, but before he can say anything, I push past him and head upstairs. I lock myself in the bedroom and pull out my phone, dialing Olivia's number with shaking fingers. It's time, I say when she answers. I have the evidence we need. Let's take this bastard down. Olivia's voice is fierce with determination. I'm on my way, Lana. Hang tight. We're going to end this once and for all. I hang up the phone and take a deep breath, my heart pounding in my chest. The final showdown is coming, and I'm ready to face it head on. Greg and Janice may think they've beaten me down, but they have no idea what I'm capable of. They've underestimated me for the last time. It's time to show them what a woman scorned can do. The confrontation comes sooner than I expect. I'm in the kitchen, making dinner and trying to calm my racing heart when Greg storms in, his face twisted with rage. You stupid bitch, he snarls, slamming his fist on the counter. You think you can outsmart me? You think you can destroy everything I've built? I take a step back, my heart pounding. What are you talking about, Greg? He holds up his phone, his eyes blazing. I just got a call from my boss. He says there's been an investigation into my finances that they found evidence of embezzlement and fraud. My stomach drops. The private investigator must have tipped off Greg's company. I knew it was a risk, but I didn't expect it to happen so fast. Greg, I... I don't know what you're talking about, I stammer, trying to keep my voice steady. He grabs me by the arm, his fingers digging into my skin. Don't lie to me, Lana. I know you're behind this. You and that lawyer friend of yours, trying to ruin me. I wrench my arm out of his grasp, anger boiling up inside me. You ruined yourself, Greg. You're the one who's been stealing money, lying to everyone. You're the one who's been abusing me for years. His face twists with rage and he lunges at me, his hands wrapping around my throat. I gasp for air, clawing at his fingers as he slams me against the wall. You're nothing without me, he hisses, his breath hot against my face. You're a pathetic, worthless piece of shit, and you always will be. Black spots dance in my vision as I struggle to breathe. I'm about to pass out when suddenly the front door bursts open and Olivia rushes in, followed by two police officers. Get your hands off her, you son of a bitch, Olivia shouts, her voice shaking with fury. Greg releases me, and I crumple to the floor, gasping for air. The police officers grab him by the arms, wrestling him into handcuffs as he screams obscenities. Lana, are you okay? Olivia kneels beside me, her face etched with concern. I nod, tears streaming down my face. I'm okay. I just... I can't believe it's over. She helps me to my feet, her arm around my waist. It's not over yet, honey, but we've got him. We've got all the evidence we need to put him away for a long time. 
I watch as the police officers drag Greg out of the house, his face twisted with rage and hatred. Janice stands in the doorway, her eyes wide with shock. What have you done? She whispers, her voice trembling. I meet her gaze head on, my chin lifted defiantly. I've taken my life back, Janice, and there's nothing you or Greg can do to stop me. She stares at me for a long moment, then turns and walks away, her shoulders slumped in defeat. I turn to Olivia, my heart swelling with gratitude. Thank you, I whisper, my voice choked with tears. For everything. She hugs me tight, her own eyes glistening. You did this, Lana. You had the strength and the courage to stand up for yourself, to fight back against the monsters who tried to break you. I take a deep, shuddering breath, feeling like a weight has been lifted off my chest. What happens now? Olivia smiles, fierce and determined. Now, we make sure Greg pays for what he's done. We make sure he never hurts you or anyone else ever again. I nod, a flicker of hope igniting in my chest. For the first time in years, I feel like I can breathe again. Like I'm finally free. There's still a long road ahead of me, I know. The divorce, the custody battle, the criminal trial. But with Olivia by my side and the truth on my side, I know I can face anything. Greg thought he could break me, could control me forever. But he underestimated me. He underestimated the strength and resilience of a woman pushed to her limits. And now, he's going to pay the price. One way or another, I'll make sure of it. The divorce hearing is a brutal, drawn-out affair. Greg and Janice pull out all the stops, slinging mud and lies, in a desperate attempt to paint me as an unfit mother. Janice takes the stand first, her face a mask of false concern. Lana has always been unstable, she says, her voice dripping with fake sympathy. She's prone to fits of hysteria, to wild mood swings. I worry for Mason's safety in her care. I clench my fists under the table, anger boiling up inside me. How dare she try to twist the truth, to make me out to be the villain in this story? But Olivia is prepared. She presents the judge with the evidence we've gathered. The photos of my bruises, the threatening messages from Greg, the financial records proving his misconduct. Mrs. Thompson, Olivia says, her voice calm and measured. Can you explain why you never reported your concerns about Lana's supposed instability to the authorities or sought help for her? Janice sputters, her face turning red. I... I didn't want to cause trouble. I thought I could handle it myself. Olivia nods, a small smile playing at the corners of her mouth. I see. And can you explain why, if Lana was so unstable, you encouraged your son to marry her and start a family? Janice opens and closes her mouth like a fish out of water, unable to come up with a response. Next, it's Greg's turn on the stand. He tries to paint himself as the victim, as the long-suffering husband who only wanted to keep his family together. But Olivia is relentless. She grills him on the abuse, on the financial misconduct, on the years of control and manipulation. Mr. Thompson, she says, her voice hard as steel. Can you explain to the court why you felt the need to monitor your wife's every move, to cut her off from her friends and family, to control every aspect of her life? Greg's face turns purple with rage. I was protecting her, he snarls. She's weak. She's easily led astray. I was doing what was best for her. Olivia scoffs, shaking her head. No, Mr. Thompson, you were doing what was best for you. You were exerting your power and control over a woman you saw as your property, not your partner. The judge listens to the testimony, his face impassive. But I can see the disgust in his eyes, the anger at the way I've been treated. When it's my turn to take the stand, I tell my story with a steady voice and a clear head. I talk about the abuse, the fear, the helplessness. I talk about the strength it took to break free, to fight back against the monsters who tried to break me. And then I play my trump card. I present the judge with the recordings I've been making in secret. Recordings of Greg's abuse, of Janice's manipulation, of their lies and deceit. The courtroom goes silent as my words echo through the speakers. Greg's face drains of color, and Janice looks like she's going to be sick. The judge listens to the recordings, his face growing darker by the second. When they're finished, he turns to Greg and Janice, his eyes blazing with fury. In all my years on the bench, he says, his voice shaking with anger, I have never seen a more clear-cut case of abuse and manipulation. The evidence presented here today leaves no doubt in my mind that Mrs. Thompson has been the victim of a sustained campaign of terror and control at the hands of her husband and mother-in-law. 
He turns to me, his face softening. Mrs. Thompson, I am so sorry for what you have endured. You have shown incredible strength and courage in the face of unimaginable adversity. I am granting you full custody of your son, as well as a significant portion of your husband's assets as compensation for the abuse you have suffered. Tears stream down my face as the weight of his words sinks in. I've won. I've beaten Greg and Janice at their own game, and I've taken back my life. I turn to Olivia, my heart swelling with gratitude. Thank you, I whisper, my voice choked with emotion. For everything. She hugs me tight, her own eyes glistening. You did this, Lana. You had the strength and the courage to stand up for yourself, to fight back against the monsters who tried to break you. I take a deep, shuddering breath, feeling like a weight has been lifted off my chest. For the first time in years, I feel like I can breathe again, like I'm finally free. The road ahead won't be easy, I know. There's still healing to be done, still wounds to be mended. But with Mason by my side and the truth on my side, I know I can face anything. Greg and Janice thought they could break me, could control me forever. But they underestimated me. They underestimated the strength and resilience of a woman pushed to her limits. And now, they're paying the price. One way or another, justice has been served. Ten years later, I hardly recognize the woman staring back at me in the mirror. The lines around my eyes are deeper, the gray in my hair more pronounced, but there's a lightness to my step and a joy in my heart that I never thought I'd feel again. After the divorce, I threw myself into rebuilding my life. I went back to school, got my degree in social work, and started a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping women escape abusive relationships. It wasn't easy, juggling my studies and my work with being a single mother to Mason, but every time I felt like giving up, I remembered the strength it took to leave Greg to fight back against the monsters who tried to break me. And Mason, my beautiful, brilliant boy, he's grown into a kind, compassionate young man with a heart as big as the sky. He's the light of my life, the reason I wake up every morning with a smile on my face. We're having breakfast together one sunny Saturday morning when there's a knock at the door. I open it to find a man I barely recognize gaunt, haggard, with a haunted look in his eyes. It takes me a moment to realize it's Greg. What are you doing here? I ask, my voice cold and hard. He shifts from foot to foot, unable to meet my gaze. I, I just wanted to see you, to talk to you. I cross my arms over my chest, my heart pounding. We have nothing to talk about, Greg. You lost that right a long time ago. He nods, his shoulders slumping. I know. I just... I wanted to apologize for everything I put you through, for the way I treated you. I stare at him, my mind reeling. Is this some kind of trick, some new manipulation? But the look in his eyes is genuine, the remorse and shame palpable. I've lost everything, he says, his voice choked with emotion. My job, my money, my reputation. Even Janice won't speak to me anymore. I've hit rock bottom, and I know it's no one's fault but my own. I feel a flicker of satisfaction at his words a sense of vindication, but it's tempered by a strange sense of pity, a realization that the man standing before me is a shell of his former self. I'm sorry, Greg, I say, my voice softening, but I can't forgive you. I can't forget what you did to me, the years of abuse and control. He nods, his eyes filling with tears. I understand. I just, I needed you to know that I'm sorry, that I take responsibility for my actions, and that I'll spend the rest of my life trying to be a better man. I watch as he turns and walks away, his shoulders hunched against the wind. And for a moment, I feel a flicker of something like closure, a sense that the past is finally, truly behind me. I close the door and turn to find Mason standing in the hallway, his face etched with concern. Was that Dad? he asks, his voice trembling. I nod, my heart aching for the pain and confusion I see in his eyes. He just wanted to apologize to take responsibility for what he did to us. Mason is quiet for a long moment, his brow furrowed in thought. Do you think he meant it, that he's really sorry? I sigh, running a hand through my hair. I don't know, honey, but what I do know is that we've built a good life for ourselves, a life filled with love and joy and purpose, and nothing and no one can take that away from us. Mason nods, a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I'm proud of you, Mom, for being so strong, for never giving up on us. I wrap my arms around him, holding him close. 
I'm proud of you too, Mason, for being the kind, compassionate, amazing young man you are. We stand there for a long moment, basking in the warmth of each other's love, and as I look out the window at the bright blue sky, I feel a sense of peace wash over me, a knowledge that I've finally, truly won. Greg may have lost everything, but I've gained more than I ever dreamed possible. I've gained my freedom, my self-respect, my sense of purpose, and most importantly, I've gained a love that will last a lifetime, the love of my son and the love of myself. It's been a long, hard road to get here. But as I stand in the sunlight, my heart full and my head held high, I know that every step of the journey was worth it. I am a survivor, I am a warrior, and I am finally, truly free.